Hello everyone and welcome back to Nature Watch. We're here once again enjoying the delights of Cornwall and in this episode we're going to be taking a look at the habitats here in Cornwall, how they change themselves and how some of the animals that live here can change the habitats of their own accord. This is a really exciting episode full of some really wonderful segments. I hope you're going to enjoy it and let's kick things off and get right back into another episode of Nature Watch. To kick things off, we're going to be taking a look at an animal which has been very recently reintroduced here in Cornwall. This animal has an incredible impact on the habitat that it lives in, and in order to find out a little bit more about this animal, we're going to head over to Haley now. Listen to that sound. And that is the sound of a really special creature, one that was absent from the UK for over 400 years, and it is exactly what we're here to see today. The wonderful beaver. Now these are rather elusive rodents that like to hide away in woodland creeks and boggy moorland, but there are a few ways you can spot them, if you know where to look. Now this here is one very common sign that beavers are present. Now as you can see, these wide indents here are made by the beaver's front incisors. And behind me, there's an even more obvious sign. So this heap of sticks and wood is built by the beavers and is called a dam. Now back in the 13th century, beavers were found all across Britain and it wouldn't have been uncommon to find signs of activity like these. However, now in Cornwall, only 20 individuals live here. So what happened to them? Five hundred years ago, in the Tudor era of England, poetry and art were booming and the population of Britain steadily grew. With this, the lower classes needed food, merchants wanted items to sell, and the upper classes desired symbols of status. Unfortunately for our beavers, their fur was considered quite the status symbol. Warm and luxurious beaver fur was highly valued and often used to make woolen hats for the upper class. But it wasn't just British beavers that were hunted for their fur. French beavers also suffered, as in the 17th and 18th centuries, beaver hats were produced for the French military and navy. With inflation, a single pelt would equal a year's salary in today's wage, so no wonder they were such a sought-after commodity. Their fur wasn't the only reason that beavers were hunted. As well as sporting a fabulous coat, they also smell fantastic. Beavers secrete a musky substance called castorium from their scent glands to mark their territory, which is a substance often used in perfumes and medicines. And the final nail in the coffin for the beavers was the meat they provided. In the 17th century, the Catholic Church even allowed beaver meat to be eaten on Fridays during Lent, despite the fact that consuming meat was forbidden during this time. Now, the logic behind this being that due to their ability to swim, beavers were considered to be fish and therefore allowed to be eaten throughout Lent. For 500 years, beavers have not been a part of our established UK wildlife. But in the 1980s, talks began about reintroducing them to the UK. There are still many questions surrounding these reintroductions, such as will bringing them back create conflict with humans and how will this affect both their habitats and our lives? Now to answer some of these questions and learn more about why we can now find beavers back within UK borders, I'm going to talk to Chris from the Cornish Beaver Project, who runs this very site. Hi Chris, so lovely to meet you. Hi Hayley. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting us here really to experience well all this amazing work that you're doing. So we thought we'd start by asking you a little bit more about yourself and your role on this project. Well, I'm um, the chap who uh, owns the farm with Lloyds Bank. We kicked off the project in 2014, and um, so I've been involved in it ever since then, really. So 2014, that's quite a while, but as I'm aware, this isn't the first beaver reintroduction in the UK, is it? Uh, no, it's not. No, the very first ones were happening uh, around about 2001, 2002. 
So, so far in the UK, they're kind of kept in these enclosures. Might there be some time in the future where we see them back in the wild? Uh, there are beavers living wild already on about 10 rivers uh, across the whole country. And they've, they've kind of got there by beavers escaping and that kind of thing. And, and, yeah. and, uh, um, and then, lo and behold, they find it quite nice in our conditions here to thrive. set up and yeah they and yeah. they they kind of just thrive yeah. yeah but we are coming to a point in the next six months to a year maybe uh, when there will be an official route you can go down to get a license to let beavers out into a wild location and we're just coming up to five years of beavers actually being here wow. now what, what are the family like here who do we have well we've got mum and dad and uh, some of their offspring they uh, seem to get on really well here, and although you, you know, when you look around closely, you can see there's lots of things that they've done, but there's still a lot more that they can do here. Yeah. Um, you know, there's plenty of trees still, uh, and there's plenty of vegetation for them to eat. So they're, they're in a, a pretty good yeah. uh, estate here. Nice, and what do you see as the future of this particular project? Eventually, I see uh, it being opened out um, so that beavers can come and go as they wish, if you like. Amazing. Well, it all sounds really exciting. Thank you so much for letting us come and You're chat to you today. You're really welcome. <laughs> and good luck with the future of the project. Thank you very much. Well, the ongoing work here at Woodlane Valley Farm is incredible. Just being able to get up close to these animals is something that hasn't been possible in Cornwall for hundreds of years. But setting up one of these projects is not a simple task. So why do it? To figure this out, we have to look into the impacts that beavers can have on their environment. The still waters created by a beaver's dam are perfect for plankton. These tiny water-based organisms are food for many other larger organisms like invertebrates. Invertebrates thrive in warmer pools, meaning they become perfect prey for breeding birds that migrate to these ponds as they thaw earlier in the year. Beaver introductors in Europe have even been shown to triple wetland diversity. What's more, fish feeding on this mass of invertebrates become food for larger predators like herons and otters. With the introduction of a single animal, this ecosystem blossoms into life. This boom in biodiversity caused by the beavers is what gives them the title of keystone species. Without them, the environment would degrade back to its initial state. Instead, they create a cycle of habitats as dams are created, abandoned, destroyed and replaced. It is incredible what the introduction of one small mammal can do for increasing biodiversity and ecosystem stability. Whilst these beavers remain here, we're going to see dramatic changes to the Cornish landscape. And I, for one, cannot wait to see what the future holds. From beavers to beaches, we're now going to be heading to the north coast of Cornwall to take a look at Penhale Dunes, an environment defined by wind. The North Cornish Coast where water and wind meet to create some of the most incredible landscapes in all of Cornwall. Here at Penhale Dunes, the entire ecosystem is managed by the movement of sand in the wind. These dune hills go on for almost five kilometres. Closest to the sea, the wind has the strongest effect. Some immense formations have been created here such as this huge cliff. With embryo dunes forming a barrier, the deeper you get in the dune system, the less wind has an effect. The first dune systems that you find here are these primary dunes, closest to the sea. Here, only a few flowers grow and a few animals can be found. But as you head deeper into the dunes, you begin to find a more varied ecosystem. The wind still holds an influence over these parts of the dunes. These bushes have been pushed by the constant stream of wind. Even the marram grass leaves shadows in the sand, eerily geometrical in a seemingly ever-changing system. Larger animals leave trails in the sand, such as this trail left behind by a lizard. But such trails don't last long. Soon the sand will blow again, and hide any evidence of its passage through these parts. As you go further back into the dunes, you begin to see less of the sand and more of the vegetation, 
as the ecosystems become more and more complex. The wind still has an effect here, however, with few large plants being able to grow successfully. In amongst this new, heavily vegetated area, smaller animals begin to make their homes, such as this bee. It seems to be doing a good job, however, despite the wind. Further back in the dunes, trees begin to take root, which means an even greater variety of life can be found here. On the top of this hill, the remains of a hunt, a dead snake hanging from a bush, dropped by a hunting buzzard from above. Its remains have become discoloured, and most of it has been consumed by scavengers. With this greater protection from the wind, flowers which stick out over the ground are able to flourish. Orchids grow here in great numbers, and they attract a wide range of pollinators. These six-spot burnet moths are taking advantage of the multiple flowers on the orchid's head. In amongst these dunes live one of the UK's rarest butterflies, the silver-studded blue. Their name originates from the small blue speckles in amongst the spots on their underwing. This male has opened his wings, revealing the stark blue colour that makes all blue butterflies so distinctive. This male and female are struggling to mate. Perhaps they should have chosen a less windy day. Further back, when the dunes dip, not only are more trees able to grow due to the lack of wind, but by reaching the water table, a marshland environment is able to form. Water is rare in the dunes, so animals come from all over to utilise this resource. There are a lot more birds in this environment, such as these linnets taking advantage of the water by bathing and drinking. Horsetails can grow here which provides alternative habitat for many wetland species, such as these crane fly. Ragwort, a common countryside flower, also grows in these areas. It's a key host plant for the burnet moth caterpillars. These dunes may be ever-changing, but their importance for the wildlife that lives within it will remain the same. And regardless of the level of vegetation, each area of the dunes is important for its own special group of species, which is why Penhale Dunes is such a vital site for wildlife in Cornwall. Having seen the magnificent windswept North Cornish coast, we're now going to take a look at an often misunderstood creature that dwells all over Cornwall. So let's head over to Harrison as he explores the world of one of our wonderful reptiles. Past the border of my acre, high above the Cornish seas, tangled up with firs and bracken, pocked with pits and granite brocken, runs a strip of barren croft lined with twisted trees. This is where to watch for adders, thick ones on their secret ground, waking at the death of winter, when the cattle's restless canter and the swallow's sudden flight spell the springs around. With the poem Kingdom of the Snake by Cornish writer Arthur Caddick, he tells the tale of a very special animal found along the rocky outcrops of this coastline and across the UK. The adder can be easily distinguished from our other native snakes and legless lizards by the sharp zigzag pattern on its back. A walk along some heathland might award you with a short glimpse of this secretive animal as it disappears back into the undergrowth. Throughout the months of April and May, the darker male adders compete with the right to mate with the females. To do this, they fight. The battle between them can look more like a choreographed performance than a hormone-fueled dispute, earning the name the Dance of the Adders. 
At the end of this violent belay, the winner will mate with the female, who will then incubate up to 20 eggs inside her body. The young adders come into the world through a live birth and immediately have to fend for themselves and hunt for their own food. The unusual way that they come into the world is not the only thing that makes these adders so distinct from other British reptiles. What is most interesting about the adder is the way they hunt. The adder has a secret weapon found in no other British snake. Walk here, stranger, but be wary. Listen always for the hiss. Then look down, see, there's an adder. You've no time to stare and shudder. Jump to miss the poison fang and the viper's kiss. Hematoxic venom is the adder's weapon of choice. Shrews, mice, voles, you should all be aware of the viper's bite. Once injected into their prey, the venom begins to work on the animal's blood, causing hemorrhages due to the loss of blood clotting. Soon, the prey will be dead, and the adder can have its well-deserved meal. This may make the adder seem rather scary, but these effects rarely cause death in large animals like us. While some say it's the only venomous snake to have put Steve Backshaw in hospital, all we know is that impacts from the toxins generally remain quite local to the site and treatment is very achievable. In the past 100 years, only 14 people have been killed by an adder bite and the last victim died in the 1970s. An adder is much more likely to slither away from someone than it is to strike, as its venom is predominantly saved for hunting as opposed to defence. Adders certainly don't bite if unprovoked, and to humans, this snake is relatively harmless. Throughout the centuries, the adder has been persecuted due to fear and ignorance. Such negative sentiments are very clearly displayed in Arthur's poem. As the lightning streak of venom sways in menace, keep away if you have a stick and strike it. Do not stoop to touch or take it. Die with dying day. This poem was written in the 1950s, and it's clearly obvious that opinions of the adder in the past century were a little unfair. But the opinions of people are no longer the only threat facing a long and prosperous future for the adder. The main threat the adder now faces are habitat loss and fragmentation. The adder thrives in heathland habitat and hedge grove just like this, much of which has been destroyed due to changes in land use through agriculture and land development. As a result, pockets of adder populations are now cut off from each other, with these bottlenecks resulting in restricted gene flow and reduced genetic diversity. This can make them vulnerable to further habitat changes and hereditary diseases. This threatens the adder's future if not properly managed. Disturbance by people is their main threat. Adders play a crucial role in the ecosystem, acting as predators that keep populations of their prey species low. This can have a benefit for both the wider environment and humans, as it ensures that natural food is not overeaten by rodents. This makes the adder an effective form of pest control. They are also a species very sensitive to disturbance, and once the adder disappears from an area, it often means there is something very wrong and that other species may soon suffer as well. What a cue for conservation. Luckily, there is some hope for this species. Organisations such as the Cornwall Adder Genetics Programme and Cornwall Wildlife Trust are doing their part to protect this species by researching how habitat fragmentation is affecting the adder and by maintaining the environment that is optimal for this species survival. But there is also a way that you can do your part to help this special snake survive, mainly 
by keeping your distance and ensuring that the adder can make the most of these incredible summer months. Come back here in dark December when the hungry fox forsakes distant lairs to loot and plunder where the fattened geese meander. Stranger, what has scared you now? Ghosts of sleeping snakes? Thanks Harrison for that poetic portrayal of one of my personal favourite UK reptiles in the Adder. And with that, that's the end of Nature Watch for this year. So thanks everyone for watching and goodbye. Yeah. Humphrey walking off into the sunset at the end of Nature Watch. It's so beautiful. I'm actually crying. <laughs>